described um, uh, recently by the Australian as uh, just said Adelaide property developer Theo Mar Maris is a is a passionate man. He loves his city, his family, giving back to the community, and his growing development company. Theo is uh, I'm, I'm associated with Theo because he, he and I are both working together on a uh, on a panel at the moment that's reviewing the state's planning system. And it's typical of the work that Theo does, where he gives so much back in a whole range of, of boards and committees. Uh, and one of those that he's going to talk to us today about is in his role as chair of the of the Rundle Mall Committee. And he's going to tell us about what's happening in Rundle Mall and what the uh, future holds for how we can make Rundle Mall great. Would you please welcome Theo Maris. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the invitation to address you on something that I do feel very, very passionate about. Um, thank you for the build-up, Stephen. I will leave here. You might have to enlarge the doors a little bit so I can get my head out of there. But um, at, the end, at the end of the day, we are all South Australians, Adelaideans, and I think I can honestly say that we're all very proud of where we live. However, we seem to be always knocking what is very, very, very substantial, very, very good, and we really don't know how lucky we are to live in this country, to be part of this community, to be able to invest in this beautiful, steady, stable nation without having the fears and the stuff that's going on around the world. We forget how lucky we are, and it was Stephen who said to me yesterday, we almost need a crisis to realise how, how good we've really got it. Anyway, um, just let me tell you, there's a few things that I have been able to beat in my time, and yes, Stephen, anorexia was one of those things that I was over, able to overcome. <laughs> uh, now, uh, down, to, down to Rundle Street, the, a little bit about the history of Rundle Street. Um, I'm sure you all are very much aware of uh, how it started, but just to make sure that we recap and go back a little bit, Rundle Street was basically made up by very, very small family uh, traders who basically started off by selling off the back of a cart. There was no planners, there was no mares, there was, there was no interference, it was just people who, who got together in a particular street and started to trade their wares. And from there on it built up into a situation where Rundle Street, as it was called, um, became the centre of retail in Adelaide, for Adelaide, for, for very many, many years. Um, the traders became property owners and they traded from their buildings, and as a testimony to that, if you walk down the street and just bear to look up, you'll see all of the names of the traders. And there's many of them who unfortunately are no longer trading in the street, but the history is very well recorded there. It's a pity that that happened because uh, the mix that was available in the time from the early 18, or the middle of 1800s to 1900s actually sat exceptionally well and the street built up very, very quickly and there was some very major stores that built up around that. There was obviously retailing clothing and, and furniture and haberdashery and I, I can actually remember uh, white good products being sold in a big way from Godfrey's and others in, in the street. Um, of course, there was food, there was entertainment, and all of the things that we today want to bring back into the mall. But the thing that I can remember most of all was the fact that there was shop fronts and people would promenade up and down the street as if, where do you go? You go to Rundle Mall and go for a walk. Something that, you know, for many, many years uh, has not been the case because the street turned around from being... Uh, part night and all day trading into a nine to five retail strip which was sad and it, and it suffered very, very badly from just 
taking out all of the other after hour uses. I can remember there was a particular basement theatre that you'd go in there and you could watch the news of the day and there'd be this monotonous tone. Uh, in 1956, this is what happened in... Yeah, and it went on and just kept on repeating the news time in, time out. There was cinemas, there was, there was something like seven or eight cinemas that were there for people to go to. There were coffee shops. Of course, six o'clock closing and those sort of things weren't in the game. Now, what, what actually happened? Well, what happened was that the Dunstan administration argued with the Adelaide City Council for about three years into turning the street from a retail vehicle pedestrian street into a mall. In the end, it was an order given by the then administration of government that if you don't do it, we'll close it anyway. So the Adelaide City Council agreed and Rundle Mall was born. And let me say that Rundle Mall in that era developed to be one of the best retail strips in the Southern Hemisphere. Because what it had, it was unique, it had all of the retail mix and entertainment that you wanted. Of course, what happened in that time was that the property owners who were then also retailers took the opportunity of the increase in property values to sell out, and they did. But what happened? Investors came in, not attached to retail, not interested in who was going in or who was going out. What they were interested in was one thing. What is the best return that we can get for this property without considering that if the, if the, if the mix in the street was not correct, their asset will diminish in value, their rents would go down. And for a very, very long time, what happened to Rundle Mall was that all sorts of investors local and overseas would buy and hand over to property managers and property managers obviously would take the instructions of their uh, landlord and just get me the best and highest rent. Did not work. And what happened was that the people that build centres like Westfield, Candells, AMPs and so forth went in, took all of the tenants, and what you found was two dollar shops and um, and a series and a series of phone shops building up in the mall. Now, why would anybody? Why would anybody want to go into the city, pay for car parking, and find exactly the same product that you've got at Marion and you've got at Arndale and you've got at Tea Tree Plaza and you've got in every other shopping centre? We actually lost the game. And that's when I had a few words to the then Lord Mayor Michael Harbison, who, by the way, is a great friend of mine. And um, at the time, Michael and I disagreed about the situation. And Michael said to me, well, rather than being a guerrilla fighter from the sidelines, why don't you get in and do something about it? Well, I have made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I didn't really think that this would have been a mistake. And I said, I'll take the challenge, get me on. Which I became a member of the Rundamore Management Authority. Uh, the Rundamore Management Authority was set up really as an organisation to promote the mall. Nothing more, nothing less. Didn't have powers to look at tenant mix, didn't have powers to look at ours, it didn't have powers to do anything. The very thing that I couldn't understand was you've got 120,000 people working in the CBD, and the shops close between 5 and 5.30. Why the hell would you want to be a retailer and close at 5 or five to 5.30 when all of the population was then about to leave? I, I just couldn't understand that philosophy. So we launched into a campaign about tr extending the trading hours, and making any sort of change in Adelaide is difficult, but this one, proved to be somewhat easy because once we talked to Harris Garfs and they said we'll do it, well obviously Myers and David Jones got in and then the rest had to follow. But let me tell you, it hasn't been as successful as what we wanted it to be because the smaller traders 
rejected the fact that they should be opening up. The opportunity of trading was not an option to them. What was an option? That they were making enough without extending their hours. So I think we've still got a long way to go with that. The other thing that I couldn't understand was that every capital city around Australia opened on most public holidays. So I went to the Premier, had a meeting with the Premier and the Treasurer and said, look, we invite people into the city and we have a big splash and advertise about how good Adelaide is and yet Adelaide, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, Mr Premier, it is actually closed unless the mall is open. And um, the response that I got was, well, I'm not here to change anything. If you want to change that, go and see the union. So I did go to the union, and the union said to me, you know, uh, we don't believe in what you're talking about. There's enough trading days. And I said, listen, I've got to tell you something. Christmas is coming, and that's on the 25th of December. I've got something to give you on the 26th of December as a belated Christmas present, and I took out a page that I had actually designed up, and it said, unions deny employment to their members. Well, <laughs> I won't go through the language, but uh, I, I can play the language game, and I, you know, I can, I can mix it with that sort of thing if you, if you want, and I was very happy to be there and we exchanged all of the royalties that one would want and um, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day I was promised uh, that uh, there'd be another meeting in seven days time if I agreed not to do anything, which I did agree, do nothing and let's see what we can do. Anyway, uh, time is not on my side so I'll move along. We did get the public holidays and we increased the retail of uh, Adelaide by about uh, 120 million uh, in addition to the original 800 million that we were getting at that time. However, where are we going? We had to convince the Adelaide City Council that spending 30 million dollars in upgrading the mall was going to be a great investment. It would encourage not only further development, which we've got all of a sudden it all started to happen, but we would get international traders, international traders into the street to really make the Rundle Mall a unique place to shop. Unique in the sense that what we're looking for and what we're getting is the one of type tenancies where they do not repeat in the suburban, district or area centres. Now. The first one that we got was actually by accident because we just happened to make that particular phone call was we got Nike to come in and um, Nike opened up then followed by uh, Nestle who opened up one of their special little coffee shops on the corner of Gawler Place. They sell the pods and the rest is now history. We then spoke to the Agent General. Um, in London to gather up a few of the top end retailers like Topshop and, and like Tiffany's who are American but they have a head office for the Asian Pacific Basin in Adelaide and let me tell you where we're heading at the moment. Because of the fact that Australia is so well placed economically and because of the fact that Australia, and in particular South Australia, have only got seven to seven and a half percent unemployment. The rest of the world is looking at Australia, and in particular Adelaide, as a retail mecca. And there is, and I can tell you, there is a lineup of tenants that all want to come as space is available to Adelaide and to invest in Adelaide. And when retailers come to Adelaide, it's not about investing two or three or 400,000. Today, for a retailer to come to Adelaide, it's over a million dollar fit out, plus their staff and their commitment to a tenant and everything else. In, in one particular case, with Topshop, they are coming. Uh, can't say where, but they are coming to Adelaide. They're talking about an eight and a half million dollar 
fit out plus dot plus the commitment. So we're really talking about things that are going to happen. Finally, we knock Adelaide. We knock the Rundle Mall. We knock everything that happens around us. And yet, it's probably one of the better cities in the world. I've just come back. I know this George Clooney um, suntan that I have uh, is real. It's not, not out of a can or a bottle. <laughs> I, I can assure you of that. But I've just come back from overseas. And, and let me say, the minute that we got off in Adelaide, although things were a little bit quieter, I can assure you that it's one of the best places in the world to live, invest in, and we should be very, very proud of it. The future for Adelaide, as far as I am concerned, and I do invest in this city, and I have reason to be very, very careful as to how I spend my money, let alone other people's money, um, I, have, I have a great feeling for Adelaide, and I think that we've got a long way to go uh, to reach its peak. Uh, I know that people talk about mining, and everybody dropped their jaw at the time when someone said we're not going ahead with the biggest mine in the world. Well, who cares about the biggest mine in the world? All I care about is the fact that the small business in, in Adelaide is up and thriving, our children have real employment, and there is a future for the next generation. And there is. So, having said all of that, there is one final thing I want to say. Sitting at my table this afternoon, um, I heard that this organisation raises somewhere in the order of about a quarter of a million dollars a year. I just want to say to you, congratulations, keep doing it, because one of the things that I have learned is give back to your community, and I must congratulate you all for doing that, as I feel very strong about giving back. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. I think that the worst part of the deal that was ever done behind everybody's back and behind closed doors was exactly what you've talked about, but I can't control Business SA. That was something that was negotiated and done behind everybody's back. I'm not apologetic about it. I am absolutely disgusted about it, and um, I don't believe that that should have happened at all. So I'm in total and absolute agreement with you. John Bassett. Look, Adelaide Oval and everything that's happening around by the Riverside development is obviously going to have a great effect in the city. All you've got to do is just have a look at what happens when we have that one international cricket game and a couple of other games down on Adelaide Oval, the ant trail of people that actually come into the city, not just to watch the game, but just to be part of a city atmosphere. It's, it's like having a, a, a festival. Uh, I, I feel very, very confident, I'm very happy about the fact that Adelaide Oval has been brought back into the centre of the universe and um, I think we're going to get a lot more than what we actually expected to get. Um, I know that when the Crows, uh, as part of my family and the other part, support uh, the power, they go into state and they don't go there just for the one day as they have been coming here, they go for the weekend and um, I think that that will happen here too, so we'll get sports, tourism, and um, it's not just the Adelaide Oval. I think what you've got to understand is that that whole development, including the billions of dollars that are being spent all the way down, um, we've got to make it pay back to us. And I think it will, because the convention centre will certainly work and bring more people here, as the Oval will as well. We've gone into that 
special event coming to you next year in May. I'm not on a walk for right here against that Highway Street. What do we do about that Highway Street? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've, I've got to tell you, um, I'm saddened by Heine Street and I'm saddened by the authorities who choose to do nothing about it. It's all about keeping your hands over your eyes and ears and blocking out the fact that we've got a, a major problem. I spend every year toward, close to a quarter of a million dollars in fighting what I call drug outlets who want to come down to Rundle Street. I will not tolerate what's going on in Heinley Street at our end of town. Now, if the authorities want to stop that, there are, there are ways and means, and we've spoken to them about limiting the hours of trade, limiting the, uh, taking away licenses from operators who are basically corrupt. Now, uh, I know that I've been hauled over the coals on many occasions by some of the publicans down there, uh, but I don't care. The fact is, the fact is that they put a very bad look on our city. And our city is only one square mile. You can't afford to have a cesspool in the heart of your city. But, you know, we, we, we are also to blame because we tolerate it as well. Because we, as the people of Adelaide, are not sort of saying enough about it. So it behests all of us to be able to come up and say, come on, we want this to stop. Um, there has to be change and uh, the answer is yes, I am happy and I have been part of the changes that have been made uh, in the mall. I think there is a place in every city to have a pedestrian, pedestrianised section for retail. However, um, I'm not quite sure at the moment whether we couldn't have a situation where you had a shared pedestrian and uh, traffic flowing through in the evenings. I'm not, I, I'm not sort of very clear in my mind as to whether you can't have a shared uh, area for people and vehicles to be in after hours. Um, I remember trucks, trolley buses, trams and everything else going up and down what is now the mall. And in recent years, um, I know that people have talked about putting a tram back into the mall. Unfortunately, the, the retailers do not want to have um, anything happening to the mall other than the pedestrian walkway. At the end of the day, uh, one of the things that we've got to do is look at what is best for Adelaide and, and use some leadership. The other issue is that a lot of people sort of go by, popu by popularity vote, not by reality of what's going to be good for everybody. So my view is there could be change. There's one more. Okay, uh, one more, Peter. Theo, thank you for being such an enthusiast. I want to take you back to the beginning of your talk and reflect on some comments made by the Transferring Property Council Director, Nathan Payne, I think yesterday's paper, where he talked about the need for us to stop knocking ourselves. So I just wanted to if you could try and expand on the knocking. We, we, we tend to knock ourselves and get, as you said in your earlier comments, we've got so much to be proud of. Look. I think that we're very isolated in the southern part of the globe and uh, we're the southern state of Australia and we really, really have a great life, great lifestyle, great opportunities um, that we don't really understand what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, as I said, the suntan, I've just come back from overseas and let me tell you, Europe is a complete and total mess. And I come back to Adelaide and I hear 
the sort of things are, you know, this is right, this is wrong, we can't do this, we can't do that. For God's sake, be positive. We can do anything. We can take on the very best in the world. We have everything going for us, including a very healthy environment. So really, I've just got to say one thing. Stop knocking the state, stop knocking the city, get behind it and support the very good things that we've got. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, uh, Theo is not so much a shrinking violent as a rampant sunflower. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, and I think we're, uh, we're all are very much better for Theo's presence in Adelaide and his preparedness to say what he thinks and uh, uh, to be out there advocating for really good things to happen. He's a very successful businessman and a great, uh, a great contributor to our community. Would you please thank Theo for his contribution?